in which we shine a light into a murky world. I am Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host friend and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hello, Ray. We promised the people we'd turn our attention to fraud, Graham. We did, Ray, and it does seem to be a growth area. Mm. Let's establish terms then. Fraud is deception intended to result in financial or personal gain, right? Yep, that's about the size of it. Uh, There are two essential elements there, deceit and gain, Mm. and one necessary connection, that the deceit was with the intention of profiting from it in some way. Now, that covers an awful lot of ground, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, it would include an employee overstating their expenses, for instance, wouldn't it? Uh, Yes, the deceit is claiming more than you spent using the receipt, sorry, Ray, Um, intending a profitable overpayment in return. Which you can then go and spend as you see fit. Um, Mm. But to be clear, if I make a mistake, that's not fraud, is it? That's right. If you make an honest mistake, there's no intention that you should profit from the deceit. But proving it was a mistake might be hard. Uh, But so might proving it, it wasn't. Mm. There are all sorts of legal tests that we don't need to bother about here, but I think the point is that a mistake can become fraud if I later discover the mistake and I don't correct it. I'm going to both widen and narrow the scope of your liability here, Ray. Well, that sounds painful, Graham. Widen (laughs) Widen it how exactly? Well, because it's not just whether you caught the mistake, but whether you should reasonably have been expected to catch it. Okay, so the reasonable person test, but not really in my favour. No, that's right. But it does help you in another context. Oh? Yeah, so having discovered your error... Or it being determined I should reasonably have discovered it. Well, yes, uh, all that. But but having (laughs) discovered the error, however, you should only have to take reasonable steps to correct it. Ah, okay. So you mean that if it will take far more time and effort to put it right than it cost in the first place, you might not have to bother? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Mm -hmm. Of course, your view of what's material and reasonable and the courts, well, they might differ. Well, yeah, indeed. Uh, So what other common examples of fraud can we share? Well, we've looked at an employee, but fraud can go all the way up the food chain as well. Accounting misstatements by a company's leadership, if deliberate, are another example of fraud. Mm. And what's the gain that they're seeking here, Graham? It might be one or more, Ray, of a whole range of things. Mm. It might mean an overvaluation of shares the owner wants to sell. It might mean the company avoids tax or other inconveniences like, well, insolvency, for instance. (laughs) Okay, so a financial institution might think of these as internal fraud committed within the organisation as part of the person's role in the organisation. There's external fraud too. Yeah, so when people outside the financial institution, for example, seek to defraud the bank, well, that could be external fraud. Mm. They might lie about their income to get a loan they wouldn't be granted if they were truthful. Heaven forbid. Mm. Or they might lie about their true identity, tell a bank Mm. they are someone that they're not and saddle the person whose identity they're using with a debt. Mm. So I've always thought of that as identity theft, Graham. Well, yes, the identity has been stolen, but when the identity thief uses that ID, he or she is deceiving the institution for gain, and that is fraud. Mm, Yeah, I see. And it's not just a financial institution that someone can commit fraud against. No, indeed. If you think about a classic confidence trickster who might commit, say, charity fraud or a romance or crypto scam, that person lies so that innocent people will pay the money that they can disappear with. It's the mark who is the target, the victim of the fraud, not the financial institution that may have transferred money. Okay, now that's interesting. We'll come back to that point. But first, I want to cover the fraud triangle, 
that we always hear about. You're right, we do. Off you go then. Uh, well, this is a framework that's often used to explain why fraud happens. It relies on three factors, opportunity, incentive and rationalisation. OK, so opportunity refers to circumstances that allow fraud to occur. In a scenario where there are tight enough systems, there might be little or no opportunity for fraud, so we will not see much of it. Mm. But the more complicated, fast-moving and easily accessed financial services become, the more fraud is likely to be attempted. And the more complicated society and our relationships become, the easier it is to connect to people and to mislead them as to your identity or purposes, the more that fraud is likely. Mm, yep, that's the opportunity factor in a nutshell. OK, what's next? Incentive, Graham. Now, that one seems relatively straightforward. If you stand to gain much from it, you're more likely to have a go. If not, you probably won't. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But there are more factors than that to think about. So, for instance, you might look at relatively poor rates of detection or mild punishments as incentives to commit fraud. If you're an employee who is remunerated according to a measure that allows you to cheat, that might tempt you. Oh, that's a good point. Mm. Yes. And then last, we have rationalisation. Absolutely. Now, this is how the fraudster justifies their actions, if only to themselves. They might feel they have no other way of surviving in an economy that's failed them, for instance. That's pretty topical just now. Mm. They might believe that everyone else is on the fiddle and if they don't join in, they are actually losing out. They may even think that their victims will get compensated by someone else and they won't actually lose out at all. Mm. There's a lot to think about there, Graham, and, and I think that anyone charged with fighting fraud should be looking for ways to reduce all three of those factors. Yeah, picking up on that last point, Ray, and going back to the example of fraud against another person rather than against the bank itself, mm -hmm. the mark has freely made a payment to the fraudster, haven't they? That's absolutely right, Graham. If the mark instructed the financial institution to make a payment, that's an authorised payment. And it's hard to see that the institution is at fault for making that payment. Which is not to say that they won't refund the customer when the fraud comes to light. Mm. Of, often they will. In the UK, for instance, there's been a voluntary code in place since 2019. That means institutions are quite likely to do exactly that, assuming that the customer hasn't been grossly negligent by sharing their PIN or password with someone, for instance. And even in that event, the institution might end up refunding the money. We know cases where defrauded customers have given a fraud to their banking details, believing it was the bank that was asking for them. Yeah, so fault here isn't necessarily the issue. Mm. Fraud that is lying to get money or other benefit that you're not entitled to, is a societal harm. And financial institutions are to a large extent expected to clear up after the fraudsters and make good a fair proportion of the losses that victims incur. Which hardly seems fair on the financial institutions, if I'm honest, but it does give them an incentive to tackle the problem. Yes, it does. But increasingly, the industry is worrying about the moral hazard effect here. Moral hazard, Graham? You mean where the person suffering the consequences of a risk isn't the one who makes choices about incurring it? Yes, that's exactly the one, Ray. Mm. Think about the fraudster here who has escaped with the cash. Remember our fraud triangle and the rationalisation factor. The fraudster might see this as a victimless crime. Yes, that's true. Now, not only has the fraudster not contributed to the restitution, nor has his or her bank, which received the fraudulent money. It's only the sending institution, the victim's bank, has paid the cost, and that doesn't serve to dissuade the fraudster. Quite mm. the opposite, in fact, because the victim, now compensated, has less cause to pursue the matter further. But isn't this a bit like football penalties in the old days, Graham, before VAR technology took all the fun away? Um, you, you knew that some decisions would go against your team, but others would be in your favour, and it would all even out somehow in the end. Well, in the same way, you might bank some victims and some fraudsters, so compensating your victims and having someone else compensate the victims of your fraudsters, it's all swings and roundabouts, surely. 
Well, I suppose that's that, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, okay. Mm. So either way, the banks and other institutions have a direct financial incentive, don't they, in detecting and even better preventing fraud? Yes, yes, Ray, they, they do. And it's worth noting that's not an incentive they have when it comes to money laundering. Mm. Defeating money launderers doesn't save money typically and actually costs money in terms of lost transactions and other fees when business has to be blocked or, or turned away. Nonetheless, most institutions will want to have comprehensive defences against both fraud and money laundering, of course. Well, yes, they will, although sometimes the two phenomena are unhelpfully lumped together. Well, sometimes they belong together, don't they? Uh, I mean, some controls work identically against both money launderers and fraudsters. Uh, I mean, identification and verification of customers is one. Having assurance that you know who you're dealing with is a prerequisite for controlling against both fraud and money laundering. Uh, yes, it is. But there are tools that don't work against both phenomena or that need to be used very differently. And that isn't always recognised, especially where there isn't a separate fraud risk assessment alongside the anti-money laundering one. Um, mm. How about an example, Graham? OK, then. Well, the obvious one is transaction monitoring, where your system should be looking for fundamentally different transactional patterns and exceptions. Money laundering rules will usually be about anomalies in terms of the, the size or the number of payments or the types of payees. Yeah, like why is a car dealership paying for imported wheat? Well, yes, that's the sort of thing. Exactly. Mm. But what we're looking for in AML transaction monitoring is anomalies, things, things that just don't make sense. Whereas a fraud transaction should be harder to spot. It has to be reasonable enough to fool the victim, after all. Yes, Ray. So you have to be clear for each rule and scenario you get alerted on mm. what it is you need to investigate. I mean, it's no good discounting a money laundering alert just because you've determined that there's no fraud involved. And similarly, a fraud rule that fires needs a fraud investigation to clear it, not a money laundering one. Yes, hopefully that's clear. Um, yeah, so there's another aspect to this as well, Ray, though. And what's that, Graham? Timing. Sorry? I said timing, right? Sorry. sorry. <laughs> couldn't resist it. Timing. Right? No, I imagine you couldn't resist, Graham. Mm. Um, mm. Timing's an issue, though? Uh, yes, money laundering is usually detected after the event. Mm. Typically, the controls aren't all preventive. And we certainly know firms with AML transaction monitoring backlogs that are, well, let's say considerable. Mm, yeah, that's true. They're looking at transactions that were completed perhaps months previously. That money is long gone. Hmm, but that's less often seen with fraud-related transaction monitoring, which, if it can prevent transactions from occurring through hard stops, can save money for the institution immediately, as well as preventing crime, of course. Hmm. I think you're suggesting that there's less of a financial incentive to act quickly on AML because unlike with fraud, you don't save money as an institution by catching it before it completes? Well, Ray, that would be one interpretation of what we sometimes see, certainly. Um, but it isn't one that makes me feel very comfortable, to be honest. No, me neither. Moving on then. Mm, um. <laughs> so, um, one of the reasons that fraud and money laundering are often looked at together is that fraud is a predicate crime for money laundering. Money that's gained through fraud is the proceeds of crime, self-evidently. So when it gets moved on by the fraudsters, they are engaged in money laundering too. Yeah, and if you think about it, the identity thief commits a whole series of crimes from mm. stealing the identity, committing identity fraud, using the assumed identity fraudulently to get money, that is, and then laundering that money. Indeed, Ray, but it's worth pointing out that fraud is one of the many predicate crimes. There are 22 according to the EU's sixth money laundering directive, but, but I'm not sure that's such a helpful classification. Mm, yeah, and it happens right at the end of a chain of criminality. It's the last job of the criminals who want to gain free use of their criminal spoils. Yes, that being the case, anti-money laundering is really the last chance to break that chain. And it's a real shame that it's viewed mostly as a crime we seek to detect after the event, rather than taking a more preventive stance. Mm. That's a sobering note to end on, Graham, but I, I think end we must. Yep, that does seem the natural place for the time 
being next time, Ray, I think we should dig a little more into some specific fraud typologies. So we'll be doing multiple episodes looking at this topic then, Graham. Ray, it will be something of a fraud fiesta. At this point, I believe I'm contractually obliged to say that I'm looking forward to it.